My name is Todd Ponsky. I'm a pediatric surgeon at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And today I'm going to talk about an always controversial topic. What do we do with the adolescents? What type of hernia repair do we do? Do we treat them like children and do a high ligation or treat them like adults and do a muscle or a mesh repair? So we're going to get to the bottom of this. So I have no disclosures. Let me start by saying this. Both pediatric surgeons and general surgeons are bread and butter of hernias. So we both are pretty confident in the way that we do the repair and we, in general, like our results. So if a pediatric surgeon was asked, how do you fix an indirect hernia? We would say we do high ligation of the sac. But in an adult, we would say we do muscle or mesh repair. So it, depending on what type of specialist you are, you're gonna do a different repair on the same exact problem. So we actually put out a survey and we asked uh, thousands of general and pediatric surgeons, how would you fix this guy? Would you do an open high ligation? Would you do a laparoscopic high ligation? Would you do a laparoscopic mesh repair, an open mesh repair, or an open muscle repair? And the results were really interesting. We looked at one group that we broke down that basically said that they would only put in mesh 14% of the time. And the other group said that they would put in mesh 65% of the time in the exact same patient. But when you look, they both were trained by the same anatomy books, the same physiology books. Everything was taught exactly the same. But the pediatric surgeons, for some reason, don't like mesh in this guy. And the adult surgeons do. And it has to do with what we're used to. So the question is, what is this hole? Well, I'll show you. When, when we were being born and in development, uh, as the testicle migrated down, the peritoneum vaginated between the muscle layers. There was no hole in the muscle. The peritoneum found a little space between the muscles and invaginated. And then the peritoneum sort of regressed away. But if it stays open, now you have a patent processus vaginalis. All it is is invaginated peritoneal tissue that went between muscles. And so if you have this child who has a hole, if you ask me what this is, I'm going to say it's not a muscle defect. I'm going to tell you there's actually normal intact muscle. If we just remove that tissue, the muscles will shut or close. So we do a high ligation. And it works. We know that Ziggy Ein and many others have shown about a 1% recurrence rate when you do a high ligation in a child. Why does it work? It works for exactly this reason. The peritoneum is just keeping those muscles from shuttering closed. So it's like a little uh, space that's falsely created for stuff to get in between those muscles. It's creating an avenue, a canal for those contents to go through. So if you remove that tissue, the muscles will shut or close and nothing will be able to go through. The muscles will go into their normal position. The best example is the towel in the door. So if you take a towel out of a door, the door will close. That's exactly what happens with the patent processus vaginalis. If you just remove it, the door will close. So we do know that it works in children, but when does it stop working? I mean, at what point should we stop doing high ligation? Or asked differently, when does a patent processus vaginalis become a muscle defect rather than just peritoneum? So in a child, this hole, I would say, is probably just peritoneum with normal intact strong muscle behind it. But in an adult, you could say, no, now uh, I'm saying that this could have stretched out. And even though it looks exactly the same, it has a different pathophysiology behind it. So what about him? Would you fix him with a high ligation or mesh? And then most people would say these kids look like they should get a high ligation. But if it's this spectrum, well, how do you know when to decide to switch? Most people say him, which is crazy because why? He's a little taller than the one before. At what point do we have, it's so arbitrary. And so the question is, can we figure out a, a real point uh, to give us more insight into when we should be switching? We do know that things change. We do know. We do know that adults have direct hernias and children don't. Well, at some point, something must have changed. And maybe that's our indication that is when the pathophysiology of an indirect hernia changes because there's some change in the floor. Maybe that's an indicator for us that things have changed. So wouldn't it be great if we can measure when direct hernias start to develop by age? 
So we did this, but two hospitals, a children's hospital, Akron Children's Hospital, and an adult hospital, George Washington University Hospital. We combined all of our data together and we grafted out an ageogram by age when direct hernia starts to develop. And you can see all the way to the left, at an early age, it's almost exclusively indirect, and all the way to the right, they're equal. So there's this slope up as the direct hernia start to develop. So what can we learn from this graph? Well, without any science to it at this point, I'll tell you arbitrarily looking at this, it looks like at or just after age 40, I see a, an abrupt upward slope. Uh, so maybe that's something. And then I see another kind of change here at around 16 where it goes pretty flat and then it kind of bumps upward to a higher slope. So. I think those are two inflection points in this. The rest of the slopes look about equivalent, so but the slopes change at around 16 to 20 and maybe 40 to 45 uh, is when we start seeing a, a slope change. And so maybe that tells us that somewhere in there is when we should be thinking that things start to change. But I will tell you this, between 16 and 20, it looks very pediatric to me. Uh, it's still in that pre-slope increase phase. So that's why anyone between 16 and 20, I think should get a high ligation. And that's the summary of my talk right there, is that that's the age group we're talking about. Over 20, I'll give you. But 16 to 20 still looks like it's in that pediatric slope. Another way to look at the data is, is there a percent chance that a patient would have a direct hernia associated with that age that would make you decide, hmm, that's the age I'm going to start doing mesh. So if I told you that at that age group, 95% uh, of patients don't have a muscle problem, would you use mesh or not? Uh, what about 10%, what about 90%? Uh, in other words, what if I tell you that 90% of patients don't have a muscle problem? Would you then at that point say, hmm, I should put mesh in this patient? So you have to decide that number for yourself, uh, but here's the, here's the data. Uh, the data is that when you're 10 years old, you're about 2% chance uh, of, of having a muscle problem. And if you are at 14 to 16, you see a big jump, but still it's only 10%, right? So still most patients don't have a muscle or mesh problem, even though it's up from when they were babies. But when you look at 17 to 20, it gets to about 20 to 22%. Uh, that to me is a big jump. So you can make an argument, I think, that that's a reasonable jump, that's a high number, that maybe 17 to 20 is the age we should be putting uh, mesh in or muscle repair. We also looked at recurrence. So we said, well, let's look at how does high ligation hold up in adolescence? We did a multi-center retrospective review with a median follow-up of 60 months. 210 people responded to the questionnaire. And we suspected recurrence in about 2%. That means they told us that they think they sort of feel a bulge. We would call that a recurrence. Only 0.9% actually had surgery for a recurrence. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty good. Uh, it's pretty low numbers of recurrence if you do a high ligation in an adolescent. Uh, we then looked at laparoscopy and we looked at multiple different techniques. Basically, the laparoscopic approach is divided into percutaneous or intracorporeal. You can either do it with a needle from the outside and lasso the peritoneum or do it with uh, a scope and two instruments intracorporeally. I do it percutaneously. We lasso the peritoneum at the internal ring and we cauterize the peritoneum to make it scar. We looked at 10 hospitals, 3% recurrence after doing a lap high ligation in adolescence. There was an 11th hospital that, went, that had a, a much higher recurrence than the rest. Uh, and so that one outlier, if you add his cases, it goes up to 6%, that one, case, that one um, hospital. But when you take it away as an outlier, you'd have 3%. So it's either 3 or 6%, depending if you want to include that surgeon. So the final point I'll make is that if we're going to study any of this, we really have to make some definitions here. So a lot of surgeons do, you know, if they have a direct hernia, they put mesh. And if they have an indirect hernia, they put mesh. So they sort of treat it the same. But if we're going to try to understand how these hernias behave, we have to differentiate indirect from direct. We have to say, okay, let's not look at recurrence rate for inguinal hernias. What is the recurrence rate for indirect and direct? And that's how we have to sort of analyze it because my hypothesis is that direct hernias should always get mesh or muscle repair, no matter what age you are because a high ligation will not work for a muscle problem. 
But I think indirect hernias probably can go into early adulthood and still get a high ligation. So in conclusion, I think adolescents probably don't need mesh all the time. And I think we need to do better studies to better stratify indirect and direct and really try to figure out who may benefit from non-mesh repairs. Feel free to reach out to me and, uh, and voice your opinion to me. I hope this helped. Thanks.